Okay, guys, this lesson is about one single principle that we need to apply whenever our opponent's king is stuck in the center. And yes, this is a principle that none of you know. And if you're like me, you probably have gone through your chess career for years and you had never heard about this principle. So I wanted to show it to you. And hopefully, if we do things properly, you're not going to forget it. You're going to be able to apply it next time you play a game and your opponent's king is stuck in the center. Now, quickly, to keep things simple and to make my point, I want you guys to think of all of the principles and rules that come to mind whenever you have your opponent's king stuck in the center. Now, here I'm going to give you the principle that we're going to see in practice today. You're going to see it in a game played by two super strong grabmasters. And guys, I know this might be confusing or shocking to some of you, because what we know, what we have learned up to this point is that if our opponent's king is in the center, we want to keep pieces on the board so that we can attack more effectively. Well, let me tell you the logic behind this principle. And then again, you're going to see it in practice in this game. Well, the idea is that in a position like this, if I keep the minor pieces on the board, my opponent is going to use them to create counterplay and it's going to use them to defend the king. And you don't know how many times I've been there where I do a great job keeping my opponent's king in the center, but then they just it just slips away and I cannot convert the win. So what you're going to see here, and by the way, I like I chose this game because you're going to see Grandmaster Gulko following this principle blindly, just removing the minor pieces, keeping queens and rooks on the board. And in doing so, he makes some inaccuracies, but still... It leads him through the middle game and it leads him to a win. So let me show you actually this game from the very beginning, that way everything makes sense. And you're going to see that the game starts with c4. We've had a few lessons already on the English opening, but after c6, Gulko decides to play pawn to e4. So here we go now, e6. And then the first remark that Gulko said after the game was that he decided to do now knight f3 because he knew d5 was coming. Now, what does that mean? Well, after d5, guys, all of these trades are going to occur, which means these files are going to be open. At least one of them is going to be open. And guess what? I don't want my king to be in the center. So he played knight f3, getting ready to castle right away, put his king in safety, and then bring the rook to attack the black king. So we have c takes d5, e takes d5, and then after pawn takes pawn, look at the e file wide open of course we got now c takes d5 and now guys remember i see this opportunity to develop quickly leave my opponent's king in the center i want to take it so what move is going to allow me to castle and of course get there with tempos well i want to develop the bishop i'm going to put it on b5 so that's going to be a check the black pieces did nice c 6 and now don't forget it is not only about our plans but we have to also think about our opponent's plans so our opponent is dying to just go bishop d6 knight g to e7 and castle and that's exactly what they're going to do if you go and castle right now right so instead what is the move that we need to do to make it difficult for them to castle well of course we're going to do queen e2 and now if they block with one of these pieces that piece is going to be stuck there and I'm going to castle, I'm going to start putting pressure on the king. The black pieces instead did queen e7. And guys, let's start talking now about principles. So I know that my king, my opponent's king, is going to have a hard time to leave the center. So do I want to trade queens? Of course not. Don't forget, I want to trade pieces, minor pieces, queens or rooks, I want to keep them on the board. So what move can I do right now to keep my queen on the board? Well, I need to do 95 and notice that it helps us with that. But also, it is an energetic move, centralizing the knight, gaining a tempo on this pressure that I'm putting on the c6 knight. So now we got bishop d7. I have to be careful with this now. There's no pin anymore. So we eliminate the knight. And after pawn takes pawn, look, forget about the king castle in queen side. They could do it, but it's not going to be safe. And that king is going to be stuck in the center. So all I need to do now is castle. Of course, we got to be careful with this pin. But here, guys, we should know at this point in the course, lesson 158, if they did f6, we have queen h5. Be careful when <laughs> be careful when your king is in the center and you push the f pawn, right? So queen h5, g6, give me the pawn because the h7 pawn is pinned. If they did this well-known idea, well, I could go back with check because the king is in the center and then I'm going to get the rook, right? So after castling, the black pieces realized, you know what? My king is far from castling. 
more than anything, I need to develop my pieces because if not, I'm going to get checkmated. And of course, I want to do F6 to win material. So I'm going to go King D8. I accept my king is going to stay in the center, but at least I'm threatening now to do F6. Well, right here, guys, there's only one thing that should be in our head. We need to develop quickly to attack that king. So that means any developing move that we do, we want to try to do it with a tempo. And I know the principle that we're focusing on is trade minor pieces, keep queens and rooks, but don't forget, before you trade pieces, you need to, you need to develop them. So, and I want to do that as quickly as possible. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to just trade minor pieces for the sake of trading minor pieces. If I'm able to develop these two and they do not develop their bishop at night, well, I'm probably going to use my knight and bishop to help me checkmate the king. But if they do a good job at bringing their pieces to defend, well, the best thing I could do is remove them and keep queen and rooks. So the question to you now is, you're playing this in a tournament game. You know that you need to develop one of these two. What's the best way to do it if I want to do it with a tempo? Well, guys, the move that we're looking for now is pawn to b3 and if you remember we had a lesson on what to do on dead positions well there was some b3 there as well the idea is simple i want to do bishop a3 with a tempo on the queen now if they do f6 i don't really care bishop a3 and even if the queen takes at some point i'm going to collect this bishop so instead they just went um queen e6 getting away from that diagonal and now bishop b2 and now look at this guys i developed my bishop it took me two moves to do to do that but I was able to develop it using two moves and my opponent's minor pieces were not able to come out yet. So after bishop b2, the black pieces finally were able to do pawn to f6 and now we have a problem to solve. So I want you to pause the video guys and think about what would you do next. It is not the time to drop pieces, especially your queen. So make sure that you take your time and come up with the best move. And by the way, this is a move that we have to have in mind before we did bishop b2 because we knew this was coming right well the move is actually queen f3 guys very nice move and now if they take the hanging bishop is going to be collected so of course they did not take it instead bishop d6 quickly developing their pieces and now we have to do something about the knight guys i know that a lot of you if i had shown you this position uh from the very beginning without any context you'll be thinking you know what i don't want to trade my powerful knight for the bishop that is not so good well there's only one principle that we're following at this point. King in the center, I'm going to simplify pieces. Of course, it's also nice that we're getting rid of the pair of bishops. So get rid of minor pieces. They took back with the king, and now it's time to develop the knight. And after knight h6, all of the minor pieces are developed, so it is time for us to simplify the game. Now, we're about to see some inaccuracies, but even with those mistakes... Gulko was able to convert this game because he was laser focused on eliminate minor pieces, keep the rooks and queen. And guys, it's not only about keeping them, we need to be energetic. We need to try to activate those pieces and go for the king. So now before I show you the next move, the question for you is, which of these two minor pieces is the best piece right now? Which is the one offering the most support or the, or the best defense to that king? Well, the answer is going to be the bishop. So we got to come up with a plan to get rid of that bishop. The answer is simple. We're going to do knight a4 to get to c5. They have to give me the bishop. Now, the only thing that I need is the rook or the queen to offer support to that knight on c5. So after knight a4, we got queen a5 and the black pieces are doing the right thing. If I'm being attacked or my king is in the center, I need to simplify the game, guys. But of course, white pieces did not do that. We're going to go queen c3 avoiding the trade of queens and offering support to my knight. So multi-purpose move. And then after knight g4, the black pieces are just in trouble. And look, if I show you the engine right now, you're going to see this is already 1.92, almost two points uh, of advantage for the white pieces. Now, one thing that I wanted to highlight here, notice how the, the engine is recommending now knight c5 as the second best move, but the top move is actually f4 and i want you to keep that in mind i want you to pay attention to that so here uh, the white pieces simply continue with the plan laser focused on that principle eliminate minor pieces especially the one defending the king and then after rook e8 we have rook a to c1 just putting pressure already rook e6 and then look at this move pawn to h3 again if i show you the engine you're going to see that f4 now we have three well 2.37 uh points of advantage and you're going to see that f4 is the top move. h3, not so much. Now, look at this. The logic behind the move h3 is that the knight is going to go to e5, 
and I'm going to be happy to trade the last minor piece, right? Well, the engine is saying F4 because now when you do H3, E5 is not available. So the knight has to go to a very ugly square at the edge. And this is extremely important because even this grandmaster who, of course, understands this, and he's probably done this so many times, he was so uh, focused on this principle that he ignored that possibility. But even with that mistake, what I like the most is that the principle guided him through the entire middle game. With mistakes or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we have a plan all the time. So anyhow, H3 was played, then knight 5 and he didn't even hesitate to eliminate the knight. So pawn takes, just bringing the pawn towards the center, that's okay. I'm going to go on and expose that king. Now that I have queen and rooks on the board, I need to use them to put pressure on the king. There are no minor pieces for them to defend. There are no minor pieces for them to create counterplay. So queen d3, this rook is doing nothing. Let me bring it over to the semi-open file. Queen a6, and now a4. Happy to give you the pawn so that my rook could get active and penetrate. So queen b7, pawn to b5. And guys, I'm going really quickly here because the principle, you, you already saw it in action. You saw it guiding the whole middle game. So pawn takes, pawn takes. Now we got the open file. It's not semi-open anymore. They're going to take it away from us. Should we simplify the game? Of course not. That king is still in the center. I'm going to move back and I'm hitting a7. So rook takes. They're happy to take. And look at this. This is already, guys, queen and rook versus queen and rook. This is looking more like an endgame. But the king's still in the center. There are open files and open diagonals. So of course, there has to be trouble. So after king e8, we got rook c5 trying to be energetic. It's not time to, to fall asleep and be passive. We got to be energetic. So rook c5. And now, if I show you the engine, still you're going to see 193, 240, 242 of an advantage for the white pieces. So rook b6. And then after queen c3, we're threatening to go to the seventh rank, check, and we're also attacking the pawn on e5. So after the super GM, Alexander Chabalov just did pawn to d4. Rook e5 came and they just resigned. So if I show you the engine now, this is 8.52, guys. This is completely winning now for the white pieces. Now, was this a perfect game? Uh, I doubt it. But the fact that that principle guided Gulko from this position, guys, look, from the moment he saw the center was going to be open, he brought the knight over, just getting ready to castle and attack the king. And then it was all about developing with tempos leaving the king in the center and trying to be energetic. So after we castled, king in the center, well, b3, then bishop b2. We wanted to go to a3. They avoided it. Well, I still develop as quickly as I can. Queen f3, then trade minor pieces. Then I avoid the trade of queens. We know that one from before. And now I just keep simplifying minor pieces, activate the rook with a tempo, h3, simplification, and then let's open up that king to try to put it in checkmate. And even if you don't get your opponent's king in checkmate, they're going to have to give you material and then you convert that into the end game. So there you go, guys. I hope that you found this as valuable as I did when I first uh, found out about it. And let me know in the comments if you knew it from before or not, because maybe I'm just telling you things that you guys already know. So I appreciate your feedback in order to plan our future lessons. With that said, I will see you on lesson number 159.